Good morning. Uh, my name is Agnes, and I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about the very complicated and quite mysterious life of iOS applications and running in the background. So, this talk is based on my recent experiences of implementing all kinds of uh, background functionality into an iOS application. And so, this journey turned out to be a quite interesting one, so I found it very strange. So, let's do a bit of warm up and think about why do apps do anything in the background. So, to help you think about that, I wanted to show you how many apps on my phone use some kind of background uh, app refresh functionality. So, what you see here is about 95% of my apps, which means there is like a lot of apps out there doing uh, some kind of background processing. So what you see here uh, is all kinds of ride sharing apps, social media messaging. So if you think about why they might provide some kind of background capability, you will, you will see that as a user, we want to have live updates and up-to-date content and overall seamless user experience. And so that's why all these apps uh, go all the way to um, implement all kinds of background features so users have uh, the best experience. So when I was working on this, on this uh, app I mentioned, I, I found it very challenging and I think uh, it's very important to know things before jumping into implementing such features, especially if you're working on an app that already has some kind of networking layer built up and all kinds of uh, features. Um, so my goal for today is walk you through what caused me the most headaches uh, during those weeks of trying to figure this whole uh, thing out. And so my hope is that you will ever work on any kind of background transfer feature. You will remember this talk and you will remember to look up things before even start getting started. So what we'll cover today is we'll quickly um, talk about what's the difference in handling transfers that are running in the background. And later we talk about silent content push notifications and what limitations that, uh, apply to them. How authentication in the background is different from a default foreground session. What is the resume rate limiter and how to work with it. Uh, how to test features like background processing and how to finally how to debug it. So I wanted to start out with a quick reminder of the app state. Foreground is what we will not talk about today. So I just wanted to quickly remind you that in the background, when your app is in the background, it can either execute code, background running, or it can be suspended, which means it doesn't execute code. And it can also go terminated, uh, and there's a way back from terminated. This is all that I wanted to cover on this slide. And then I wanted to show you this one sentence from uh, the app lifecycle documentation from Apple's website. So it says, background apps that consume large amounts of memory are terminated before, before those with small memory footprints. And this might sound obvious. And what's interesting about this is that you as a developer have some kind of responsibility regarding how much your app spends in one of those states in the background, right? So it's also very interesting that they point out this fact in a very high level documentation. So it's kind of a, uh, a kind of a warning sign of how limited uh, background life is for the app. So starting out with more of the technical details, using the URL session API is just a few words on what's the difference here. The most obvious difference is that you will have to move away from the completion handler based APIs 
that are very convenient, by the way, and then you have to move away to a very less convenient delegate based APIs. Not just the URL session delegate, but also on the app delegate because the app delegate is what handles the um, the callbacks when, when the system resume your, resumes your app to, to launch it in the, in the background. So the point is, it's only the documentation. What I wanted to talk to you about is the reasons why. So the reason why you have to move away from the convenient completion handler based API is because iOS runs your background tasks in a separate process, not your app's process. What does that mean? What that means in the in practice is that you can see the the process on the left hand side is, is the application process. It has a download task. I use a download example uh, because that's easy. We're downloading a file here. And so there's a download task prepared. It's handed over a background configured URL session. And what the system does is, is that it hands it over to a separate daemon process in iOS. And that process is going to uh, proceed and download your file. And then your app can go to the background and to suspend it, which means it's not running code. And so once the daemon is completed downloading that file, the system will hand you a temporary file URL uh, back to your app, launching it in the background to execute code. So in case of the file downloading example, what it means, it will launch your app and then you get this temporary file URL and let's say you can move that file to a permanent location, right? So there were some surprises along the way of moving this app from the completion handler based API to the delegate based APIs because in order to identify which uh, session you had the task initiated from that just completed, what you have when, when iOS resumes your app in the background is a session ID and tasks that have just completed. So we went through the, the, the app states. We know that your app can get suspended. That's why it's running in a separate process because if your app suspended, it can download. Your app can also get terminated. And so when it's terminated and iOS launches your, your app back to the background running state, you have no idea which session your tasks were running on. So in order to recreate that and reassociate the task, you have to store these session IDs. You also, you also have to store some kind of completion handler that's coming in in one of the callbacks you have delegate, and then you have to execute it in another. So it's kind of sketchy, but anyways. Uh, tasks are not failing, which is kind of surprising. What they do instead is they're retrying until timeout and the default timeout is one week in an SRA session configuration. Um, also, users can directly turn off background transfer capability. So the screen, what you saw on my iPhone, you can just turn it off as a user and then nothing's gonna work in this app in the background. Um, it's just good to know. And there's this is discretionary property on the NSURL session configuration, which might be treated as true, whatever that means. We'll find out now. Is discretionary is a property, and if you set it to true, it tells the system that whatever you are running on that session is something time insensitive, and so the, the system can wait for optimal conditions, meaning phone charged, uh, infinite amounts of uh, bandwidth and such. And so there's a note in the same documentation that says transfer, if the transfer is initiated by the app is in the background, is discretionary properties treated as being true? Meaning no matter how important for you as a developer and your app is to do a certain transfer initiated in the background, it might just perform 12 hours later. Um, meaning, iOS kind of forces you as a developer to only run time insensitive tasks initiated in the background. How annoying you might think right now. But if you take a step back and try to think about the reasons for a bit, you can easily understand why it's so important for iOS to be strict about such feature because you saw the list of my apps, like 
I think almost all of them do some kind of networking, at least the ones on the list of background uh, app refresh. If they, without limitations, uh, background transfer feature would just drain everyone's batteries and internet subscriptions. Also, about the direct control over, over the switch on the background transfer, um, just think about people on areas of the bird where 2G is the best network you can get. I think it's very, it's very important for them to be able to prioritize, meaning they can, let's say, turn off the background app transfer capability for Instagram because they don't want stories to get downloaded while they're working for the, uh, waiting for their Uber ride to arrive, but they really want Uber to get live updates in the background for good reason. So, um, so far, what I told you can be found in the URL session documentation. You just have to like uh, dig deep, but um, let's uh, let's slowly move into the most more mysterious parts, starting with sign-in push notifications. So, sign-in push notification is a push notification that doesn't have a sound and has the content available flex set. Uh, it's there for you to be able to resume your app in the background so it can execute some code for you. It's a limited time window, I think it's like 30 seconds. You don't have to ask for permissions from the user because it's something they don't see and they don't know about. And it's very similar to background fetch. As far as I know, it's, it's the exact same thing except background fetch is scheduled locally from your app and uh, sign and push is push notification coming from your server. So I implemented this in this app and there were some surprises on the road here too. Um, first was that the users can also directly switch it off by switching off the same exact switch uh, of background refresh, which is kind of bad because users don't know about this being implemented in your app because you never ask for permissions, so they might break uh, critical functionality. The answer here is do not implement critical functionality on top of content sign and push notifications because they might not get delivered. And this is not just the only reason why. Other reasons uh, include it's rate limited by APNS. So Apple's suggestion is do not try to send more than two or three per hour and whatever that means. And it also depends on the condition of the iPhone, right? So um, battery health and things like that. Um, the app won't receive it when the app was terminated. That's a big difference from uh, just a simple background uh, task. Let's see what Apple has to say about uh, push silent push notifications. They say the system tracks the elapsed time, power usage, and data costs of whatever you do in that 30 seconds background execution window. And they also say if you use significant amounts of whatever resources I just mentioned, may not always be woken up for the next notifications to come. So what counts? Number of notifications received, time executing in the background, and resources used. So it also might sound frustrating, but the good news is it's partly up to you how reliable the system delivers these notifications, right? Because if you do your thing right, um, you, you are quick in the, uh, processing these notifications and you, care, you think about resource management, you have a better chance of making this feature more reliable. You just have to be careful. The problem here is I don't have too much numbers to share with you because this is under documented kind of, so we don't know like where can we stretch the memory usage to. What is the ideal time of usage? I know less the lesser the better, but is it two seconds? Is it ten seconds? So we don't know much about that unfortunately. Let's talk about something more concrete where we do know where the traps are and how to avoid them. So as you might know, I'm sure you know, uh, when initiating a connection between client and server, we have all kinds of um, ways to make that communication safe and the connection safe. So what we usually do is we use SSL TLS, so communication is encrypted, but that's kind of worth nothing if um, 
you, let's say, have a successful money in the middle attack. Um, so just a note here, I'm no security expert, so please treat this information as Agnes's observations during her journey of background uh, session discovery, not like textbook how to do security on iOS. But in this app I was working on, um, we had client and server trust validation in place. In order to make sure our client is talking to the exact server we only wanted to talk to, and the server is talking to clients that are trusted. So, bad news is, you can totally not do client trust validation in, in a background session on iOS. And there's nothing more to add here. There's a bug report open with Apple for, I think, four years now. Um, anyways, let's talk about server trust validation. So what this app had in place was certificate pinning. And so what certificate pinning is, is that essentially you, you make the client um, authenticate the server certificate in a way that it kind of checks more information than just like, oh, is it signed by a trusted CA? So what they were doing is they had the server's certificate in a binary um, representation built into, baked into the app's bundle. And so when there was a request going out, there was an authentication challenge coming back. And so the client um, just compared the server certificate to the local certificate, and that's it. And it was a self-signed self certificate. So it was kind of um, simple and secure implementation of this uh, certificate pinning method. And it was all fine until they switched to background sessions when it all broke and for a reason, because uh, when in, on a background session, you can only use system trusted certificate authority signed uh, certificates for server trust validation. This is an ATS requirement, and you can work around it by turning the ATS off, but you, know, you don't want to go there. So um, what you can do instead is switch to CA signed certs, and from those kind of certificates, you can use rolling certificates, Rolling certificates, as far as I know, are the ones that are changing frequently on the server. And so, in order to pin to that, you have to keep those, uh, the public key of those certificates static, 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 so you can pin to the public key. But then you have to maintain backup keys in your application in order to uh, avoid any downtime when, when swapping out certs. And there are also kind of more expensive long living certificates. You can buy them for, I don't know, a few thousand bucks maybe for five years. Uh, and you can pin to that. But the warning sign is there because this is not a recommended way of authentication in the background. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they were doing certificate pinning. It has to do with the fact that in order to implement certificate pinning, you have to implement custom authentication challenge handlers which you might do with HTTP basic or digest, not necessarily just pinning. Uh, and so the problem here is that no matter what type of authentication you implement, if you have these authentication challenge handler, that means you have too many resumes to your app in the background, which is not allowed. And I'll talk about it in a second, but I just first wanted to show you what's the recommendation, recommended way of doing authentication in the background. And that is implementing a custom authentication scheme. So this is all from Clint the Eskimo of Apple. Uh, he's a great person. He helps people like me online understand how iOS works. And so this is from a very uh, special, hidden, but precious step forum thread. And so as Queen recommends, what you can do is do whatever authentication method you want in a foreground session, ask for a token from your server, and then use that token to communicate in the background session with your server, and then expire that token. What that means is that you will have to implement two types of authentication for your client and your server. It sounds like a lot of work just to support background fetch or whatever, right? So, as it turns out, this is not just about security. So it's not like, oh, I'm a startup, I don't handle any kind of sensitive data, so why do all the, you know, all the work for this high security? 
it's not just about that, unfortunately, it's also about making your background transfers as reliable as possible. And that leads us to the resume rate limiter. So if you remember this from before, um, I mentioned that there's this daemon dim process uh, working on your tasks uh, running on this background session. So let's talk about what this daemon process is, actually. It's called NSURL session D, and it might sound familiar because this is the thing that runs on your computer uh, allocating all your uh, CPU and uh, bandwidth usage for downloading photo library when you have a fresh install of macOS. Anyways, um, this is also all from Quinn the Eskimo, my hero. He, uh, Quinn explained that NSURL session D maintains a delay value and that delay value doubles each time you there is some kind of resume uh, resuming happening in your app to the background running stage. So this delay resets to zero when the user activates the app, which is good news. Uh, and delay resets to zero when the delay elapsed without a new task initiated in the background. And it applies to your app as a whole, not per session, because I've heard about people trying to create hundreds of sessions and running just one task per session, but that does not, that does not work. Um, so let, let me show you what happens if you have this download, file download task and there is an authentication challenge happening. What happens here is instead of the file URL coming back, first there is a challenge coming back, resuming the app from suspended to background running, and then there is this delay building out, which is, we don't know how, how many seconds is that, but the point is, like right here, your your results of this temporary file URL that you're waiting for are going to be late because you had something in between that resumed your app already. So looking at the numbers, we can see for, if you don't have custom authentication challenge implemented, you have one download, for one download you have one resume, which means if you do whatever you want, initiate another background test right after you got your results, there is delay times one seconds building up. But if you have n downloads, like chained right up to each other, meaning you receive your results, you initiate a new task, receive that, initiate a new task, that means you build up a bunch of delay. So after n resumes, it's like two to the n times this delay value. Um, if you have custom authentication challenges in place, it's radically worse. So if you have one download, you have two resumes that we saw uh, just on the previous slide. If you have n downloads, you have two n resumes. That's like way too much delay. That's that's infinite for you know in a user session. So how it looks like in practice is you have your app here, and there is download task A. Your app goes to the background, gets suspended. There's an authentication challenge coming back get suspended, there's delay. After the delay, you get your first file URL back, and then at the same time, you initiate down to B, and then don't even, let's not even talk about the fact that is discretionary is gonna be treated as true from this point. So, it's just a very, very most optimistic scenario if you have delay times two seconds delay here, and you get back your authentication challenge B here, and then delay times four seconds later, you get your five year old B back. So you, you definitely don't want to do this. But let's see how to make this rate limiter happy. So following Queen's recommendation, you can batch the transfers, meaning whatever you want to do, download up all your data tasks, you can just batch them by, I don't know, probably not like thousands, but Whatever you want to like download in the background, you just give it to the URL session on the background session, and when it's happy with all the uh, conditions on the iPhone, uh, your NS URL session D is going to download those, um, process those downloads, and then hand back the URLs in, at once, meaning you have one resume 
in your application if you batch the transfers. Also, don't use authentication that requires additional resumes, right? So, looking at the numbers, if you batch the downloads or uploads, if you batch these tasks, that means if you have customer authentication challenge in place, that will result in n plus one resumes to your app, which means a lot of delay building up, which is not good. But if you have no customer authentication challenge and you have n downloads batched, you have one resume to your app in the background, and whatever you want to do afterwards, you, you only build up one times delay, which is great. This is the best you can get, right? So this all might sound super frustrating, but um, we all know that the resume rate limiter is there to kind of keep our greedy hands off the precious resources. So without the, this resume rate limiter, developers could keep their apps running in the background continuously, right? So that's not good. If you're looking at this and thinking about, oh, but my design or use case cannot accommodate this, right? As it happened to me before, because we were totally changing these tasks and we were relying on the order of how things happen and uh, we had a short time window for that. So the bad news is, it means you're probably trying to use background transfers for something it's not there for, or you have a lot of work to do. But if you are there and if you implemented something like that, um, or about to do that, let's, let's talk about how to test these kind of features, because, you know, like waiting for a notification that's delayed to come, kind of like, you know, it takes a while and it's not, it's not trivial. But, even before that, there, there are a few uh, traps that I, I wanted to uh, tell you about. First is, don't rely on what you see from your Xcode build, because uh, when working on this app, uh, after three weeks of very hard work of figuring like half of this out, I was super happy because everything was working on my phone and it was amazing and all the notifications arrived, everything was on time. And then I built, uh, I made a test flight build, and like nothing worked. So later, as it turned out, um, the resume rate limiter is ignores uh, builds from Xcode, so development builds of the apps. Also, the is discretionary property is not being treated as true; it's being treated as whatever value you set to it. So it provides quite a different experience to you than your users will see, which can be a, a critical uh, difference. So the other surprise to us was, that might not surprise you, is that the, the APNS device token for the, for the notifications are only valid in specific environments, meaning if you have uh, your app builds from Xcode and you have a device token that you send to your server and your server is trying to send a push notification into the production push notification servers of Apple, it's not going to work and vice versa. So somehow your server has to know what kind of build this device token was coming from, uh, which is kind of odd. Um, there is this other thing that our teammate pointed out that you have to go register for remote notifications on every launch of the app because the device token might change across launches. So honestly, I don't have too much cheerful comments to add here. Uh, testing such feature is pretty difficult given all the kind of non-deterministic uh, nature of many pieces in this puzzle. But if you know all this information I just shared with you before jumping into implementing it, you could spare yourself some trouble for sure. The good news is, whatever you do, you can you have the option to at least see what was going on in your app. And that leads us to our last topic of debugging. So, and debugging, uh, to me, at all happened in a console app. I'm sure there are more clever ways of doing that, but this was good enough for me. So now that you know that the daemon process running your background tasks is called an SQL session, you can just go ahead, plug in your phone, 
plug your phone into your computer, hit up console app, type an SQL session D into your search field, and then you will see what it's up to. Okay, and if you do the same thing with this process called DASD, um, it's the Duet Activity Scheduler thing. That's the one that decides whether push notifications can proceed or not. Uh, it has other responsibilities, it's just uh, one that's of our interest right now. And you can also search for your own bundle ID, your app's bundle ID. So if you do all these three, uh, and you just kind of put the pieces together, what happened and when, you will see why and what happened and what didn't happen and uh, it's at least good to, you know, like, see how it works on the iOS side. So, I wanted to show you an example, which is, it happened on my phone, it's the weather app, the iOS weather app, trying to do a background fetch. I'm not sure if the fonts are big enough, but ha what happens here, I'm going to walk you through uh, this process. I picked a few logs. There's obviously like 20,000 logs in between the start of the fetch and, uh, and the completion, uh, but I picked the most uh, interesting ones. So. This here, as you can see, it's DASD, this do that activity scheduler daemon that I mentioned. And it receives some kind of message telling it that weather is trying to fetch. And so it produces all kinds of numbers that I have no idea what they are. But the, but the point is, it says final decision can proceed. Which is, I guess, it's a good, good news, right? So the fetch can proceed. Second, DASD log that I wanted to show you is where it says decision to run one. So now DSD is requesting the launch of the Comlet Apple the Better application, which is good news, it's finally happening. The next thing we see is that Springboard acknowledges receive trusted open application request for Comlet Apple the Better from and there's the, there's the process right there. It says DSD, PID, process ID 104. So you can totally put the pieces together based on these logs. Next one is media server D, another daemon process that says, okay, let's move client, which is the vendor's bundle ID, with the process ID 2614 to background running, which is the state when you can execute code. So we are about to see the fetch happening. It's just an assertion here that I wanted to show you because it's 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 cool to see that uh, it says comment f for the DS the background fetch is background content fetching for 30 seconds. So we finally see some numbers showing up. And then better initiate some kind of request to HTTPS API better.com slash global app air quality slash something something. So what's happening here is it, uh, it creates like hundreds of requests here for every city I have on the list of my better app, which uh, by the way, after this debugging session, I removed almost all of them, knowing that it will fetch all the cities every 10 minutes. But what we see on the next slide is that there's a, this is a call from CF network uh, through the better app. And so, I think this is where it creates the, the URL session task because it says test, some ID, and then resuming quality of service user initiated. It's kind of sketchy because I, I was totally expecting background for a background patch, but that's Apple, you know? So here we got our response for that task. It says status 200, content K, whatever that means. Point is it succeeded and now is the regular springboard uh, snapshotting the app before sending iOS sending it back to sleep. And so DSD reports the, the fetch completed and then DSD reports it's no longer running better and then the background app refresh tasks running are zero, which is great. So now 
media server D sends the app to the process ID, it's ours, it's better go back to background suspended. So essentially, the fetch was done and the app transitioned back to suspended. And then 10 minutes later, it tries to run another fetch. And now D, as he said, must not proceed. So why must not proceed? Maybe I had my iPhone in my hand with an app open that was maybe downloading something, maybe I was looking at Twitter, and when I'm paying attention to an active app, and looking at it and waiting for a download to happen, I definitely don't want iOS to download temperature data for, I don't know, Budapest, Hungary. So maybe that, or maybe it was not the time of the day when I'm usually looking at better information, right? So iOS does all kinds of uh, clever things like that. Or maybe it's just got enough background downloading for the hour and then everything's going to be, you know, cannot proceed for the next 45 minutes. The point is there are many, many reasons for the system to, to block background processing and it's annoying when you're trying to rely on it as a developer. But thinking about the reasons, we all know that iOS is fast, it's reliable, it's pretty, it's smooth. So this is why it sells so good. And this is why we can all have jobs as app developers. So what I suggest is kind of try to embrace its strictness because it's part of the magic. And if you were about to, I don't know, thinking about or about to implement some kind of background transfer capabilities into your app, I just wanted to summarize the most important things. First and most importantly, only use background transfer for time insensitive work. As you can see from this presentation, there's really no way around that. So if you're if you are starting out an app and you know that there is some kind of product aspect that might require background uh, processing later down the road, you might want to take these limitations into account before designing your networking layer because as you see, even things like authentication or whether to batch downloads or chain them have a lot to say in how reliable your features are going to be in the background. So I suggest you also master the usage of console app. I think, I think it's also a great exercise outside of anything related to background uh, sessions because we usually just, you know, like sit, look at Xcode and debug our app inside Xcode. And I think it's good to like go out of it. There's a whole universe out there. There are things talking to your app that you don't know about and if you go to the console app and just like hang out there for a few hours and see what's going on, uh, I think you can learn a lot about iOS. Um, and that was it for today, so thank you so much for listening.